Hey, Coach Dan, thank you so much for coming back on the show, my friend. It's wonderful to have you here. It's been way too long. Yeah, it's. Uh, I want to say the last, the last time we talked. I mean, was that San Diego? Was the last time I saw you? I think it was. Yeah, before the zombie apocalypse happened, and everybody was still traveling around, you know, teaching and educating. Yeah. And you're back to doing that now, right? Aren't you traveling a lot to do that again? Yeah, I just got back from uh, Northwestern College. It's in Iowa. Great place, great location. NAIA schools. And whenever I go to an NAIA school, I, I, I sometimes wish that I would have gone to a school that size and just all the athletes, half the co population is an athlete on the campus. Many of the athletes play two sports. Some play more. So, yeah, I asked if there was an intramural program because they all all these fields. And, and the guy goes, no, we don't let our athletes. And it was just funny because it was like, if half the student population is that athletes, there's no need for intramurals. You know, you have extramurals. Uh, <laughs> so it was nice. And then tomorrow I head down to uh, uh, Parker University. I, I I consult with them and uh, we'll be doing some filming, uh, I guess, Wednesday. But uh, I I got to tell you, I'm not in shape for this. Uh, those, uh, the COVID, uh, the COVID years, um, you know, I would, there's a certain kind of conditioning you have to be to do uh, for workshops and it's different than to coach on a field. And I, I'd forgotten that. Uh, like I get, uh, well, this last week I've been to two track meets and those are long, hot days, you know, sunny days, finally hot, thankfully. Uh, Long days, come home, rejuvenated. Let's go dinner and dancing. Let's go sing. Uh, a couple of years back, workshops, you know, I'd speak, stand up for eight hours, finish the day. Let's go eat dinner and dancing. Great. Now it's like I do my workshop. Boom. I just, I just, <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily just age. I actually think there is a certain hands on ish uh, that, that level of, there's stress involved obviously but mm -hmm. interactions and the the you know the the work uh, i'm not in condition for it it's just kind of funny to say it out loud but it's true uh yeah so funny i experienced the same thing when i went back to teach afterwards as well there's something to just the physical presence of of being somewhere i'm curious when you you know you've been a coach slash teacher educator for many many years um did anything really change for you in relationship to, to learning new or different things when you had to change your model of teaching people when you couldn't travel and you did a lot more online and in your, your training facility at home? Well, see, so I was lucky in a way, Perry. Um, I was one of the first online instructors. So when, right. when Columbia College hired me, uh, my boss, Arlen Epperson, said I was probably the fifth online instructor in history, which is I... I I tell my audiences this there's a couple things first I might be the first track and field collegiate strength coach uh, the first hmm. coach Mon hired me because he was worried about what was happening in the weight room because of uh, all of a sudden bodybuilding started taking over the uh, he wanted someone who could still teach the classical movements right so when I say that to, to an audience they all just look at me like wait this is a you know there's this belief by people that strength and conditioning has been around for a thousand years. It's not. Uh, <laughs> I'm amazed at the number of schools that have strength and conditioning programs now, because in the seventies, the answer would be none eighties, probably none nineties, probably none in the aughts. We probably had the kinesiology department having a weightlifting class, which was four sets of eight of wrist curls, reverse eight, reverse wrist curls, reverse curls, tricep extensions, auto, uh, Zotman curl, you know, curl, 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 curl. <laughs> Probably been the last few years. I mean, I think the place I teach at St. Mary's would be a pioneer in this and a few others, but frankly, not many. Uh, I would say the field of strength conditioning for master's degrees, and it's, not very, it's not very old. Online education, my students have this vision of this just being, oh, it's what we vote. I've taught in my career, I've, I've hosted events where we have a video and we stick it in and a person gives a workshop that they might've done nine, 10, 15 years ago. I, it says, and now press pause. And I would press pause. And then I would 
facilitate the discussion and then go back and press play. And we thought that was cutting edge, man. You know, you could get a professor from Boston College to do a workshop in the middle of Utah. You know, I thought that was uh, cutting edge stuff. So I've been around all this my whole life. And so I was comfortable with it. So a couple of things I warned people about when it first happened, when you move to an online format, the day you say, you know, buy or open or class begins, every single thing has to be finished. So on online education, preparation is the big one. You need to have, if you have an eight-week course online, that entire course has to be available the moment it opens. All eight weeks, all everything has to be done. So on online education, so much of the preliminary, it is all preliminary work. And once it starts, you know, honestly, you can just kind of fold your arms and say, wait, it's over? Oh, let's do it again. And, you know, that was the big one. And I, and I think that's the thing that shocked so many people is when they, a lot of people decide to start training their, so like, I'm just going to train you at home. Okay, Perry, I'm your, I'm your, uh, hi, I'm Dan John, your virtual personal trainer coach. Okay. So let's get started with today's workout. Okay. Uh, get your mat out. I don't have a mat. Okay. What kind of weights you have? I don't have any. Uh, okay. What kind of area do you have? Well, I got about a three foot space. Let me move the dogs. Well, that was the big lesson for most of the people I talked to at first. Yeah. Their clients had no space, no equipment, and really not a lot of interest in working out on uh, in this in this format. So, and I kept warning people that all this, when you say, you know, when you tell a client, do this exercise, you had to have the video already made. Because I've, I've tried to instruct in real time, uh, you know, with people in Israel and things like that in this format. I think I'm good, but I don't, I'm not that good. So, okay. So keep your eyes forward and push your hips back. Is that right? No, keep your eyes forward, but then I can't see you. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And so now you got someone, now you're trying to teach someone looking this way, doing a movement where everything is out of the screen. Well, that doesn't, mm -hmm. so it actually, I think it reminded, because for a long time, and this would go back to the Jetsons, uh, this would go back to a lot of different, uh, I remember the Legion of Superheroes, this idea that education could just be uh, a monitor that yell, you know, a monitor that yells at you from the wall. Mm. You know, remember that Jetsons model, you know, uh, Jetson. Okay. Well, <laughs> anyone has been around with using videos. Uh, one thing we discovered this got, this must be at least 30 years ago is that the adult, the adult, anybody over, I don't know what you want to say, maybe 25 ish can only handle about nine minutes of video education before their brain clicks off and basically they're no longer an active participant they're now a watcher right and so we had all those things one of the nice things i think that covid did is it really did i think rip open all the issues with online education uh remote teaching um and some of them are literally unfixable issues uh, unfixable. Um, I think you can you can learn you can you can do a lot of things and you know my daughter is uh, she retired uh, she moved on to being a counselor but she was a school teacher at the time and she would just say how wasteful most days were how they just couldn't get anything and there was all these issues and the nice thing I think in a way is that those of us who believe still in uh, campuses and classrooms and mentors and uh, when i'm working with you perry i'm literally working with you i'm not just learning from your what you're saying i'm learning from the way you approach a client the way you talk the subtle movements you make uh you'll notice uh gentle listeners if they're watching will notice in both of our cases the books that we have we we didn't plan this you know this is just we both have books and stuff that te my books teach that my books sitting behind you teach what they teach is that you know i love these books i'm keeping them they're important to me even though i read them 50 years ago uh in many cases 
<laughs> and some of them, you know, like Triple Jump Encyclopedia, uh, you, you just keep buying and buying because you loan them out and you never get them back again. But that's that's part of what we... So it, the greatest thing is that we've all been reminded about how much there, more there is to education than just information. There's also formation. Yeah, thank you very much for clarifying that. I mean, I, I learned that myself when I when I began to do the online format. And because you've been teaching and coaching a long time, and so much has changed in, in relationship to the overall amount of information that's available for people. And don't even get me started on the AI thing. But uh, how do you see that playing? Because I, I almost come to a point where it's not about the information anymore. People just don't know what the hell to do with all of it. <laughs> That's a coaching part, right? So in religious education, we talk about that all the time. We talk about information. We talk about formation. And, uh, you know, the smartest people at most football games I've been to are the parents in the stands. They literally know the correct answer to everything. Now, to get them to go, to, so they have all the information. To get to get that dad who's yelling at the coaches the entire game, or like the other day, who goes out and punches a referee at a game, which just as right. stuns me to think about. But the parents in the stand very often have all the information. They watch the Green Bay Packers. They know the Detroit Lions. But to get to translate the information to get in eleven adolescent boys to line up and all move on a command, or to get a you know, a, a collegiate athlete to step in into a, a into a in a rainstorm into the discus ring, you know, and do this motion. That is the big leap. So as so th they move in a. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to use yin yang because it's a um, just such a common concept now. Th they play together in a yin yang, but they swim. I mean, they it, it, you know, it's like where the the those areas where you have fresh water interacting with ocean water and the, that those tend to be the healthiest um uh, ecosystems in the world that brackish water that with the san francisco bay used to be teeming with life so when you combine information with formation you get you get far more than just sets are a you know a collection of reps done in one Okay, that, that's really helpful. But, you know, you'll figure out steps and reps, you know, probably within the first 10 minutes of doing two, 10 sets of 10 in the back squat. You know, you'll, you'll understand what that means. I don't have to explain it to you. Uh, yeah. Informate. So I think I think one of the things we have to keep reminding ourselves is, is that it's great to know this stuff, but it's the to do that's the real the real big one. Okay. Mm. It's, getting people to do the things that, that what are some of the things that you know you found for yourself because you work with all different types of clients and coaching them to uh, help them get that formation to, to do well it's it's interesting because once we move from the you know the whiteboard or the screen or the the book out to outside the the first thing you realize is that uh well, and this is this is a foundation of my, how I coach strength and how I coach any sport is uh, I think you have to take people back to no movement. Uh, so, you know, if when I'm training a, a, a new person, I, I there's a variety of planks I will have them do. Um, if I'm going to teach, mm -hmm. if I'm going to teach this movement here, that that hinge, I'm going to start off with the vertical plank. You know, that's where you you pull a band down and then I'm going to teach the glute bridge, you know, the, the isometric hip thrust. And one of the things I'm trying to do is just try to give them enough time. So they get what we're trying to get to mm -hmm. uh, in the throws. For example, we might have them grab a pole in a different position uh, and then get them into the position, shake it out and just see if we can move through it. So I go back to no movement. Uh, all the way go back to no movement. Uh, the next thing I think we really need to be good at is our is our language. Try to set. Uh, uh, yesterday uh, or whatever day I, I, I spoke, I, I taught. I use a lot of terms, just weird. Like I use um, 
internal pressure, we call it anaconda strength, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Building this up, we call armor building, okay? Uh, getting yourself into a plank is called getting into the arrow. Stay tall and arrow are the same idea. Uh, going from the hinge into the plank is bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some terms that say more. But if I say to you, I want you to grab the ground with your feet, now stiffen up your calves, now flex your quads. Now uh, I want you to tighten your glutes. I want you to you know, have a strong belly wall. I want you to lighten up here. I want you, that's great. Or I can say arrow, which which the, now they're, they're, they get you the same spot. Mm -hmm. But, and then from there, I even try to break it down even more. Like my terms in the discus are stretch one, two, three. And then in the three position, there's A, B, C that's all I'll ever teach you as a discus thrower. And that, mm. that's the terms we'll use your entire career. But once we get that common language, the common concepts, then we can move in, we can move up. Now, what happens in this, and in, in what happens sometimes when you're in a format like we are right now, is that I want to jump. I mean, I want to jump to you're at the Olympic finals on your last throw discus throwing. Because... <laughs> That it, there's a weird, I don't know what it is. It could be because of sitcoms. You know, yeah, I got only got 22 minutes to reintroduce <laughs> every character, uh, have have a problem. You know, Sissy misunderstands what Jack was saying. So, you know, now the, whatever their name, the, the family, oh, Sissy, whatever her name, whatever Suzanne Summers' name was. And, oh, she's pregnant or, or, you know, Joey wants a sandwich and now that's funny. And then boom, at 22 minutes, done there's a vague connection to the next episode but move on no <laughs> when you're working in real time with people very often you find yourself you know you, you you teach this person the vertical plank and then you realize that this person has just a i don't know uh their their stomach issues or need need instant fixing their 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 bad right knee is hurting them as they, and then you're you're doing and instead of you know teaching them from zero to hero in 22 minutes all of a sudden i realize we've been here for 50 minutes and all i've done is taught taught you how to stand up L literally all i've taught you how to do is stand <laughs> and, okay you know so i, I had and you look at this cheat sheet that you had, you know, 4,000 bullet points and, you know, and fold it over and then graphs and charts and rest periods. And you realize, yeah, this person needed to learn to, you know, stand tall. You know. So that's, that's the reality. For, and that's, I think we've all been reminded about this in the last little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that because one of the things that I've always um, loved about your work and teaching is how it goes back to you know, bedrock, fundamental, basic mm -hmm. principles that, uh, you know, never steer you wrong. And people just tend to even one, not know them or just say, ah, they're so basic. Give me the shiny gold fun stuff, as yeah. you say. And I've found that because there's even so much more information that the, the basics are lost in the bottom of the ocean. Like, so like standing tall, that's kind of a big deal. And most people can't do it, right? Well, I mean, it's basically how Joe Mills taught the Olympic lifts. It's how the British taught the uh, throws. I mean, it just keeps showing up. It's, you know, uh, it's funny you said principles, which I think is important. Prin, uh, prime, first, princes, you know, principalities. Sipple is the same root as capture. It literally means to take first. Hmm. The principles are, yeah, you can do it one of two ways, of first importance, but when I work with my athletes, it's what you need to do to win. Principles are what mm. takes winning. So if I'm working with uh, Barbara, who's an 87-year-old uh, friend of mine, uh, her when I work with principles with her, it means, well, I want her to win in life. I mean, I want her to mm. drive her own car, you know, make her own meals, you know, you know, work, live, you know, live uh, by herself proudly. When I'm working with the discus thrower, uh, Emily, I want her to take those and I want her to win. I want her, she just won the conference the second year in a row. The, the school I volunteer at never had a track and field 
um, conference champion, and now she's done it back to back. So, oh wow, lovely. Yes. Yeah, I'm a highly overpaid volunteer. So, yeah. <laughs> I tell my throwers if they get better, they double my pay. And it, there you go. <laughs> the freshmen, the freshmen don't get the joke, and the seniors, the seniors will come. Uh, the, the, the upper class will be like, "Hey, you earned your money today. Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you phrase that. In coming back to the language, as what you need to win. I mean, if you phrase something like that, I, I believe most people would say, "All right." You know, I'm all in. And I've learned that for myself over the years for my own self-talk and language, but also with the clients that I deal with. And some of Nick Winkleman's work was very influential for me on that, which I'm, I'm sure you know about uh, sure. Nick. But, you know, sometimes you just you just got this disconnect right from the get go and then you're automatically in the in the quicksand. And. And what happens is, and I call it uh, snapshots of intensity in my workshops. It's hmm. the, the problem we have now. So and let's see, it would have been 1975. Uh, it was a Wednesday night. And they had a TV show on ABC where they had David Rieger training uh, the great Soviet weightlifter. And he was doing clean pull, clean pull, followed into a clean an extra front squat, uh, and then uh, like a couple extra jerks. I wish I had this film. Then they went to uh, San Jose, California, and they drove around with uh, John Powell because he was a police officer still in San Jose, who was the great discus thrower. And they showed the athletes doing certain things. And I can remember years later, somebody told me, yeah, yeah, the only reason David Rieger jogged in that was because it was video of it. He just did it. And then I found out later, later in 84, that in Ricky Brooks, uh, the, the soul is greater uh, video. It's available, I guess, on uh, YouTube now. But, you know, he's running in it. And John said, yeah, the only time he ran was just for the, you know, for the video, for the film. For the camera. Yeah. And then in the last 10 years, it's just become the norm. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And so what happens is, you know, um, you know, this great discus thrower or shot putter will post a, a social media thing of them doing something in the weight room. So my athletes will see, you know, Edna's doing um, something for a set of 13, and then she leaps onto a thing and does something else. Okay, you just watched a 20 second video of four to eight years of work. That's a snapshot of intensity. Yeah. They, they may have been just doing it because it was funny. They might have been doing it as a lark. It might have been the culmination of six years of certain kinds of training. Mm. And yet you think that's the norm. So snapshots of intensity is, is really hurting us. Uh, in the bodybuilding uh, world, uh, there's this influencer that uh, my friend Cole got me following. And I don't even know why I follow, but... Um, I've, I've, she uses pictures that over and over and over again, and I'm, I've discovered that these pictures are four and five years old. So she had a photo shoot and it'll say, you know, look at me and she'll be in a bikini or in, uh, you know, in, a, in an outfit. This is because I do, you know, super, you know, my new upgraded, you know, super sized protein powder 1000. <laughs> the picture she has is five years ago before she invented it, you know, invent, you know, she pressed the button on a, an, on that site that you make your own protein berries, you know, your own protein powders. But, you know, you have this snapshot of intensity. You know, when I post a picture of Arnold, I don't post him on the beach at 65. I post a picture of Arnold, you know, winning the Olympia in 74, probably 74, maybe 75, depending on which one you thought he looked better. But I'm not going to post one of him, you know. Uh, he was always in fairly good shape out of contest. But, you know, um, most bodybuilders now, I mean, it, there's so much. Well, I mean, there's the tan, there's the hair, there's all this stuff. But that condition is what, uh, an hour, 22 and, and 45 minutes hmm. after years of training and a year getting ready for this. Um, with the Hollywood people, 
I have a friend who trains these, uh, uh, the, the Hollywood people. I, I actually have a couple friends now. And uh, they are crystal. I mean, the trainers and the whole crew, they are lit up for just the scene where the guy walks in with the shirt off, sees the girl and says, oh, no, and puts his shirt on. That scene has more thought about getting that guy ready to walk six feet and go, oh, I didn't see you there. We're talking six cents. That is a snapshot of intensity. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, young little Billy's going, I want to look just like whoever. And they, you know, they they fall into this program. And really the person only looks like that a few seconds, literally um, in a decade. And in many cases, they never look like it again. Uh, Tom, uh, not Tom uh, pardon me, Tom Hanks uh, destroyed his health uh, making the movie um, Castaway. Uh, you know, he to get to lean out that much, he 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 thinks that's where he picked up uh, uh, diabetes t- uh, type two. Um, so you know, mm-hmm. that snapshot it caused him long term health issues. So that's something I, I want people to hear when I, when I coach. You got to be very careful about taking these snapshots and saying this is how things are all the time. Yeah, I and mean, that's just the way everything is on social media. It's a snapshot of what is not reality. Yeah. Yeah, but we have to be we have to be vigilant that we, yeah. uh, you know, constant vigilance. Matt I. Moody taught us. We've got to be very vigilant as coaches to tell the athletes this kind of thing. And it's weird because just going through what I just said, many of the athletes go, oh, oh, yeah. Like I can only throw or jump this far a couple of weeks a year. Yes. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody You're in your who, zone. Right. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who thinks you can max in the weight room every day and, you know, post it up. I'd, I, sh- I wish we had social media when I was young. I'd have posted all the workouts, you know, back when I was throwing all, all those all those plates. But the truth is, I would always select, I mean, in an hour workout, you're only getting one lift. You're not getting those, you know, you know, those when I'm getting, you know, coming up in front squats, or I'm getting crushed and, you know, rolling around and the spotters, are, ugh, you know, that one yeah. doesn't have social media. <laughs> so. I'm curious to, uh coach of you know we mentioned bodybuilding before and the role it played in strength training early on i mean have you seen that still a, an influence in strength and conditioning and training today or is it morphed a little bit to be more like functional no. training crazy no no, no. uh it no <laughs> in 1975 arnold the educational bodybuilder came out two years later pumping iron uh that's it uh jane fonda uh, Richard Simmons, uh, body composition runs everything in my field. Um, mm. I can sit and talk to a group and they'll all nod along with me. I could have a hundred high jumpers in the room. And I would say, yeah, it, it goes against everything. Coach Isaac Newton taught us that if you're going to try to, uh, if you want to jump higher, adding that extra, you know, and I'll walk out of the room and I'll look over and they'll be doing lap pulls and curls. <laughs> Zotman curls in, right? <laughs> yeah, Zotman curls and, you know, because they want to look good for the beach. And it's uh, just for the listeners, if if you want to, if you want to jump higher, all that extra mass is an issue that your, you know, your spring has to overcome, which is hard. It, it's it's easier to to lighten up and jump higher than it is to, you know, get even stronger to jump higher. It just is. So I, you see it a lot uh, when, I, when I go and I look at training programs. We also, and, 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 and I, I don't, one of the other issues we have with, with an elite sport, okay, so we got the bodybuilding problem, but the other problem, Perry, and maybe you can help me with this, is that everybody is doing all these uh, prehab exercises now. Mm. Thousands of pre, I mean, I mean, I saw a girl's program where half an hour of her 50 minute training was prehab stuff, but she didn't have any injuries. Yeah. And I was, why are you doing all this stuff? Well, they're, well, yeah, but, the, and then you're doing 
you know, Frankenstein monster training, which I think injures athletes. You know, you're doing plyometrics without the plyometric base. You're doing all these Frankenstein monsters exercises, which I think is harder on the joints than full body movements uh, because the body knows how to orchestrate full body, but not necessarily isolation. And then you're doing all this extra stuff and you're, and, and you're not building the engine so that you can put the, the hit on somebody else. Mm. Uh, I want you to be the person who puts the, you know, the hit on not to be the hit T. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's so, no, I, I, I'm, I'm stunned how teenage athletes, especially will know every single, every single bodybuilding exercise, and then tell me they can't squats hurt your knees, deadlifts hurt your back. Olympic lifts are bad for whatever reason. Ballistics are, you know, they'll just go through this litany of exercises that are bad. But yeah. some, you know, 12 different curl ver variations is okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just go hashtag beast mode monster right, all the time. And that was one of the biggest mistakes that I made through most of my early weightlifting career was just sheer volume and overwhelm and not enough recovery time. Right. Well, it was that look was, back on it. I'm like, duh, it was right there in front of me, but I was doing Mr. Olympia's workout six days a week when I was 18. Well, of course. <laughs> well, it's interesting because even at the college football model now, college football, which I think is um, college basketball. Well, they're, they're in their own little, little world, but they pushed against modern strength conditioning so long and so hard. The, the, so we'll just put them, but in the American football, it was always harder, harder, harder. But most coaches now are going, yeah, I don't even want to see them on Tuesday, for example. Or I don't want to see, I don't want to see them on Sunday, and I don't want to see them on Tuesday. Get out, get get ahead of your academics, sleep, eat, just stay away from us. Recovery has become so much more pronounced, and I, and and I, I think I can think through how that all happened, but. It's kind of a it's kind of a fun situation to see that American football has really started to turn in this idea that recovery is important, mm -hmm. and it's better to have an athlete four years than to keep just trying to wash them out. You know, whoever stay, you know, Michigan has the motto: whoever stays will be champions. Well, I, I think the second you recruit somebody, you're, you're making a deal that you want them for their entire eligibility, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it, it, if you come, you'll be champions. If you come to this school here, you'll be a champion is a much better motto to me than if you stay. Yeah. If, yeah. I'm inviting you. We agree. Uh, I got you. I got you. We got you covered. So that's, that's my opinion. And I think it's right because it's my opinion. So, yeah, <laughs> there you go. I got a question. Sure. Um, uh Basics and fundamentals, that's a big thing, right? Are there basics and fundamentals for you that are non-negotiables no matter what age you are in your life or how well you can move or what level of athletic performance that you are that I would like for you to just meet these benchmarks for yourself to make you a winner at everything? Yeah, I use the, the phrases I would use are gaps and standards. So uh, for me, um, if you're not doing push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry, uh, some groundwork, uh, walking, then let's, let's not even, okay, let's, so there, you should, that's what you should be doing in your training, push, pull, hands, mm -hmm. squat, loaded, carry, some groundwork, walking, those are non-negotiable as appropriate, I mean, if someone always, well, I've got, and they have some story, and they can't do something, okay, generally, uh, sleep, eight to nine hours a night, non-negotiable, and if you don't, it's going to catch up on you and then you're going to regret it the rest of your life because that was a pretty easy fix protein veggies water you know i just you just have to and uh so those those are boring though all that is so boring i fell asleep saying it to you okay <laughs> but but nobody does those <laughs> but if you if you take care of that and the next step is, uh, and then we can go from there. Uh, well, the next step, you know, wear a helmet when appropriate, wear your seatbelt, don't smoke. 
Yeah, okay, floss your teeth. Okay. Again, uh, in my workshops, I have this little slide. Uh, when I got back from the Middle East, I was very ill. I lost a lot of weight to a liver parasite, 40 pounds, and I wasn't doing well, all kinds of issues. And I started uh, listening to Earl Nightingale's Lead the Field, and it transformed my life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he says, it's going to be really hard to be number one in anything. But getting the top five of any field or any anything is pretty easy. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I looked up my numbers. And so I'm, I'm a top five discus thrower in world history. And that's kind of nice. Top 5% anyway. That's yay for me. Um, to be a top five author, you have to help sell 10,000 books. To be top 3%, 20,000. It's And what you begin to do is you look at these numbers and it's just not, it, I mean, those are hard numbers to get. Mm -hmm. They're doable. And then I, he also talks about how only one in 20 Americans ret retire without any need for any other help. So at age 18, everyone gets basically, basically, now listen, there, you know, there are rich kids and good for you, you know. Uh, but for the bulk of us, we all start this race at 18. We all hit the finish line at 65. And I'm inventing this, you know. But only one in 20 have, have saved enough so they can retire without any help. But then when you start looking at athletes, you know, very often you see the one in 20 rule. Uh, when you talk to your dentist, probably only one in 20 of their clients floss once a day. Uh, I floss twice because that's what my dentist told me to do. Um, in your case, I, get, I guarantee you give clients advice all the time, right? And only one in 20 follow. Uh, right. You know, uh, when I had this wrist operated on twice, uh, Dr. Vanderhoof famously said, I've never seen anyone recover this quickly. And he goes, what did you do? And I said, well, I did what you told me. And he goes, huh. <laughs> Right, there's a novel idea, right? <laughs> and it was just like, it was just that. It was like, huh. Um, so you're the unicorn, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And then we got a, uh, uh, my friend Ed's uh, girlfriend is a, uh, dermatologist and i said uh you know what percent of your patients you know follow your advice and she goes eh, probably one in 20 and mm -hmm. so you just keep seeing this number show up over and over and over of one in 20 so to become extremely successful in life honestly do the do the fundamental human movements go for a walk eat protein vegetables and water at every meal sleep and you've nailed it. You've nailed most of it. I think you could be a very successful collegiate athlete. Now, obviously, we have to teach you your sport, just doing what I just said to you. Mm -hmm. And and that simple, that dumb simple. I know if you in it, and if then if we threw the hammer, discus shot, javelin, whatever, you know four to seven days a week with and i wouldn't let you get too far afield with bad biomechanics mm -hmm. you'll be good you'll be you'll be you'll be in the top you'll be right there in your conference final you might make all american yeah you know what i that transfers over to my world too when i see people who come in with you know different health issues and chronic pain always just ask about basics and fundamentals and in my world you know, most people are not drinking water they're drinking a lot of other things so they're not hydrated and then that's going to prevent you from actually being able to sleep when i tell you to sleep and then i just say okay um are you doing any type of breathing work and uh, most people look at me like an alien because what i've learned over the years is that we're in this small bubble of knowing about breathing and hydration and all these things but most humans don't and if they and if they just get those things so many other downstream issues <clears throat> take care of themselves but it's like an initial uh, checkbox for me that was that was, honestly coach that was one of the biggest things that stood out for me is that one um how many people have no clue about the stuff that we talk about every day that we think everybody should know mind-blowing like if i just show people say oh my goodness i can't I can't believe how much that helped. Thank you very much. And I'm like, uh, you're welcome, you know? But it's also not overloading them with doing 20 things, knowing they're only going to do maybe one, right? 
Right. And and that's why, I mean, everything I talk, I, I mean, all I ever talk about is habits nowadays, because your bad habits are habits. You know, yes, depends. right. <laughs> right. It's like people are like, and I, how am I supposed to overcome that? Those habits is difficult. I mean, most people I know uh, brush their teeth every morning. Most people I know to the point that if they went out of the house without their teeth brushed, they'd be very much like this, mm. very concerned about it. And I want, I want, if you're working with me, I want you to get the habits of going to bed early, drinking water, uh, medit- I'm a big fan of meditation, big fan of uh, breathing techniques, big fan of exercise and walking. I would want those to be as habits as anything else. Like habit, I mean, I know people who come, they walk in the in the room and they sit down in the chair and they turn on a TV set. They don't even know what's on TV, but that's that's a a learned a, a learned system. Uh, in the same way that if you're driving a friend's car at night, you probably have a hard time finding the headlights. Mm. But you probably don't. You probably haven't even thought about turning on your own headlights in probably years. A uh, a few days after you own that car, you bought that car. Yeah. Um, and that is that's what habits are, and that's um, that's why I that's why I force myself into if I'm spending too much time thinking about something, I then slap the table and say. I'm going to do this now. Uh, mm. Stop. Stop with all this. I'm doing this. Yeah. That's great. That leads me to two two things. One, I was actually, you know, because I binge watch a lot of your uh, podcasts because I learn a lot. But honestly, you've helped me become a better teacher and mm-hmm. educator. So thank you very much for that. And the one thing that I find in my world is that when I teach something or show show something, everybody just overanalyzes it and they overthink it and they just shut themselves down because they're worried about doing something the right way or the wrong way. And you had a video and I videotaped a little piece of it and I play it all the time. It was about hanging. And you said, okay, I'm just going to grab a bar and and I'm just going to hang. And then invariably somebody's going to ask, uh, are your shoulder blades retracted and are you breathing through your left nostril when all this sort of stuff? And you're like, uh, I don't know. Like and you just, just hang. Right. And then that hit home for me of just trying to get people to some basics and fundamentals, but also be comfortable exploring and trusting themselves. Right. Do you, do you find that as an issue where people can just buy paralysis by analysis sort of thing? And I don't know. And they'll put it in the YouTube comments. So the whole 8 billion of us can see that the person's an idiot. Uh, I said right there in the video, it doesn't matter. They'll still ask the questions. Right. They'll still ask. It, it, and it's right there, but they don't watch the whole video because we can see by count, you know, that, you know, the, they, they, oh, okay. Uh, and it probably will take them more time to type that question than it will to watch the whole video. Right. <laughs> and then I ignore almost all the questions. So it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> yeah, I, I I oh, try to that's why the goblet squat when I came up with it is it was a way to get away from the brain or you take your elbow and you push your knees out you take your elbows and you push your knees out that's mm-hmm. the goblet squat the goblet squat was done to just get the brain out of the way if I give your elbows a rule they're pushing their knees out then you squat perfectly perfectly and then people would look up at me I remember that for, okay, so at the first uh, cert that I taught, taught it, I said to Pavel, he goes, I'll give you, I'll give you an hour. And I said, well, I need about three minutes. He goes, no. I go, <laughs> that's three minutes if you take two minutes introducing me. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at the end of about, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds, there was 110 people and instructors and assistants all squatting perfectly in a field. And I said, Ta-da, there you go. And I and my point being, if you stop with the questions, if you just do it, if you just mm-hmm. trust the bodies, the body knows it pretty much has been there before. Just get there. It knows what to do. Honestly, you could probably have a cert on bowel movements and make it as complex as you can and all you would do is rise constipation up in the groups you teach because they will over 
uh, urination, elimination, not many people spend a lot of time thinking about it. Right. And yet they probably do it, you know, almost every day or ideally more than that. But um, uh, I, I don't know how, you know, what, how, what your audience is like, but uh, I sometimes will explain to, to like men, if you think about the act of, uh, of sexual intercourse too much, uh, nothing's going to happen. Right. right. That's true. <laughs> so you can overthink all you want, but your performance lags. You yes. know, the, uh, we used to joke, Eric Subert and I was my buddy. He was a shot putter. Uh, if you ever wanted to get into your opponent's head, just say, do you breathe in or out as you start your throw? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like the old uh, limerick about the centipede where the, the, the beetle said, which leg goes before which? And the centipede ended up in a ditch because he, yeah. <laughs> because he, if you overthink, you can't do. Uh, that's one of the things I picked that up from this book here, um, the Track and Field Omni book by um, uh, J.K. Doherty. Mm. That, that poem is in there and it hit me in the, in the teeth in 1971 when I first read that book. Oh, don't overthink don't mm. think and that's why I, I think i was a good football player because back then we used to look at like um you know uh real quick look. so i'm in my stance and i'm watching the the near side running backs outside foot well i took 21 other athletes six or seven officials a couple thousand people in the stands assistant coaches and coaches on both sides and now I'm just looking at his outside foot. Um, all that stuff can go on. But if that outside foot comes to me, I attack. If the outside foot comes away. Then I shift and I go move to my next responsibility. Mm. When, you can, when you can simplify the world into, you know, I go, you go, I go, life gets simple. And the discus, mm. you know. We're trying to hold an axis and then whirl this implement around it and the hammer. We're holding an axis and trying to whirl this implement around it many times. Uh, if you think in the middle of that, you dead. You know, yeah, <laughs> you dead. <laughs> yeah, A equals B on that one, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's interesting because uh, I was working with uh, one of my guys is uh, an, uh, an Olympian gold medalist and. Uh, we were talking, <laughs> he just mentioned to my, uh, my collegiate thrower, he goes, all I'm thinking about is relaxing the right trap because if my right trap is tight, I lose all that radius. Mm. And it just went like this. And you could just see my thrower's eyes go, oh, it can't be that simple. And my <laughs> famous last words, right? <laughs> Yes, it, it can. can. There's no way it can be that simple, right? Yes, it can, and that's and to throw, to throw farther and farther and farther. Sometimes your mind has to be relax the right trap. It can be that simple. In the mm. same way, like I think I'm, a, I'm a fabulous typist. I really am good. I'm not. I know I'm bragging, but I am a very good typist. I used to be able to type while people would come in and, and talk with me at my old administrative job, and I could talk and type the notes up at the same time. You know which was, you know, but here's the funny thing. I can tell you that that is A, this pinky is A. I'm not sure what these letters are yeah. because if I think about it, I don't type T-H-E the, I type T-E-H as the. And if I just, if I just let the fingers do the work, I don't make mistakes. But when I start trying to help, I get in their way. Elite performance, elite performance, anything everything we do if you just that's why this i got this program called easy strength for fat loss and all, the biggest feedback i get is well that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that's, that's it, it. <laughs> yeah well yeah. What about the, what if, they don't say it but but now that you know my language what about the snapshots of intensity well hmm. take a few if you're losing weight and you're looking good take some videos of yourself you know, yeah. climbing on top of the mountain and doing the whole, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you know. And then I drank 
miracle co coffee 507 you know uh you know i or whatever whatever lie you want to make i add i don't add grass-fed butter to my coffee i i add grass to my coffee i <laughs> of course of course here in utah the grass is just well gonna wither i i drink dried grass with my coffee you know? <laughs> I, I drink dried grass with coffee grounds because I'm even more elite than you, you know. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, when I teach to how to do some lymphatic resets in the body, you know. <clears throat> I show people these uh, six points, and, you know, and then they go, uh, that's it? That's all you got? I'm like, yep, that's all you need. And then they do it and they go, holy crap, I can't believe how much of a difference I feel. I'm like, yep. You know, effective things don't have to be complicated. And that reminds me of something I learned from um, an osteopathic physician once. His name is Jean-Pierre Barral. And it stuck with me. Is that he said, uh, feel first, think afterwards. Mm, yeah. Which, which means just be there, you know, in the moment, in the presence, and then break it, break it down later. Because if you overthink things, you lose the ability to move naturally. And that's what life is. Right. I mean, next time you go for a walk, think about it, think about what you're doing and, and you'll do, it'll, it'll be funny because you'll start, <laughs> you'll try to overwire these, you know, try to jump on top of these, it, but it, it, all of a sudden you start typing and your fingers get tied in knots. Yeah. That's why I like those basics, you know, because <clears throat> sometimes you'll jump on and you have those snapshot moments of people posting something is just like a circus act with however many implements I can use in one shot. Right. Yeah. And uh, you just overload the nervous system that way. I know we're coming to a close here very soon, but I wanted to add, I wanted to cover something because I like to review the basics and the fundamentals a lot because it helps me. And one of the things that you mentioned that was very helpful for me, and uh, my wife loved it when I mentioned this one because I started to do more things, and that's called uh, shark bite. Like you know, shark. Boom. Can, can you explain the sharp bite on that one? Because that was such a profound shift in, in my whole life. Yeah, shark bites. Um, it's an idea from Rob Wolf, that, uh, and I think I've really run with it. It's the idea that when you email me, I tend to email you right back. If I, if, you know, I mean, obviously, you've, and you've seen that, right, Perry? I'm, I'm, yep. If you text me, if you call me, I answer the phone. Uh, if I'm asked, it's, I got a magazine asked me to write an article. I already started on it this morning and I, you know, I was on a road, I was on the road last night because I saw it this morning. I made my two big notes and here we go. Uh, I basically wear the same clothes every single day. This, uh, the reason I have 16 of these black V-neck uh, shirts, uh, I never think about what I'm going to wear. It's a shark habit, one bite and it's gone. So if you ask me, I say yes or no, and that's it. Yes or no. And it's weird because I will, someone will say, Dan, do you want to do a workshop in Iowa? I'll say yes. And then about a week or two later, I'll get like, we really would like you to come. I already said yes. I said yeah. yes. The date's X'd out. Uh, I haven't yet got my flight, but I will later, you know. Uh, I said yes. Yes or no. Um, you go around my house. Uh, I put all vegetables in Pyrex, uh, Pyrex or uh, now I'm using mason jars too. So when I you open my fridge, you see kimchi, you see sauerkraut, you see diacon, you see uh, last night's uh, peppers that were cut. You see you see vegetables. That's a shark habit for me because when I open it and I'm hungry, I start pulling the vegetables out and I'll add it to a protein, obviously. But it's a shark habit. Um, gosh, there's so there's so many, my whole life is so it's hard for me to see them. So shark habits is this idea that one bite and it's gone. So your yes is yes, your no is no. Um, your, you have a routine. I, I don't really use alarm clocks anymore because mm. uh, I, I mean, I go to bed, I go to bed, I go to bed and I wake up, I wake up at my, my, I set my alarm for seven this morning so I wouldn't miss you. And I was up at uh, uh, six o'clock and wide awake drinking coffee, doing my work. So it gave me two hours to prep, prep for you, not one, which was nice. Um, and it's because once you start setting yourself up, um, 
and then the, the and it's and its cousin and i'll get to the cousin in just a second but shark habits is where you try to anything in your life that you can turn into a on off yes no do it mm. if you find yourself um here's another one so i have a morning basket under my in on under my bathroom sink and i have an evening basket under my sink so in the mornings i pull the morning basket up you know you'll notice how beautiful my hair is because i spent hours on it uh that has that has my toothpaste uh, uh in the morning i use one toothpaste in the night i use another one just because it's i got the two boxes i i do take supplements at night so those are in the the evening uh those are in the evening one i do put it on because i live in utah I put on a lotion every morning with uh, SPF with the sunscreen on it. Okay. Morning basket. I scrape my tongue morning basket. I have floss sticks morning basket, evening bath. So how long does it take to set up these uh, baskets? Well, it takes once and you've got it forever. So in the morning when I'm getting ready, I pull that basket out. I do all the things that's in the basket. I'm not thinking, I mean, I just look, I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't want to brag, but I'm a pretty smart guy. When I see a, see a floss stick, I don't have to think about what I'm going to do with it, okay? Uh, yeah, oh, I, I'm going to floss my teeth. That's me. Um, I usually, very often, I'm watching YouTube videos or watching the news or whatever. And I'm, I'm just doing these things because my skin doctor wants me to do this stuff. My uh, Dr. Bernetti wants me to keep an eye on this. My dentist wants me to do that. My dental hygienist wants me to do this. But I don't think at all that I'm doing all these things that my my medical core is asking me to do. And don't folks, I'm not making it sound like I, I, my dentist tells me to floss my teeth twice a day, scrape my tongue and brush. They're in there. My skin doctor, doc, Dr. Williams, very good skin doctor. He wants me to put this stuff on every day. I do it. He also asked me to do a, a thing or a, another thing or two. It's in there. If there's a pill I have to take because I picked up something jarty or something like that, that, that pill will be there in there mm. so i don't have to think about it okay i don't know why i said jardy oh because my dog died a couple months ago um you don't think anymore mm. uh, you can you can expand that out if you don't want to floss uh, in the morning i keep dental floss sticks in the well of my uh, driver's side in the car so when i drive i'll floss um i don't think about what i wear i don't um in not long after we finish here People are going to pull up. Today's Monday. Today's a military press day for me because that's what my Mondays have become. I've segued into a different. For a few weeks, I'm doing a different thing. But Mondays, I'll be doing press and I'll be doing matching ab work with it. I'll be doing. I mean, I know exact. Mike's pulling up here in 25 minutes. Uh, I'll have the cars backed out because every day at 9:30, people from all over the world come and train with me. Hmm. I don't even think about it. It's just what I do. After I do my presses, my other stuff, we go for a walk. Um, that's what I do. That's Love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that made a huge difference for me because I would just like, let me think about it. I'll give you the answer later. And it just fell into like the quicksand of procrastination and my life felt so cluttered. Well, and it's interesting because a lot of this comes from back when I was young and good looking had the world going on i was an administrator in the catholic church and i was able to sit down with some you know some very influential nationally visible people and the the one person told me a good thing uh archbishop niederauer he said if you need an answer today it's always no <laughs> and he would say he goes there are times i'd have to think about something but his, his response is he said that in this so pirate map a, a shark habit is usually yes or no but there are some things you have to think about and i think there are certain workshops you do there's certain places you go like for example if someone says to me do you want to do a workshop in moscow now this happened a few years ago and i said i have to think about it and they didn't mm -hmm. like that this moscow for gentle listeners for those you don't know not the one in idaho but the one in russia <laughs> right a little the reason, different the reason i had to think about it is i had to think about how going to the former soviet union would impact my work with the united states military ah right yeah yeah, yeah. 
So I had to think about it and the person didn't like it. And so, well, if you need an answer now, the answer is no. Mm. If I am going to do a workshop for uh, a rival school, generally my answer is yes. I don't, that doesn't bother me at all. I, I'm a big believer in, especially in the throws, I want everyone to get better. So that's, and that mm. if, if, if I help you defeat my athlete, I'm actually okay with that because it's, we're all getting better. And that's, you know, we're all, you know, we're all rising, but there, there's been certain times, certain places that I've had to think about the location, the Moscow examples is by far the best or what the school kind of, uh, if the school has, there are some places that are, I, I would want to think a little bit more about, the graphics of how that's going to look with me. Not a single listener probably even cares about that, but I do. You know, there, you know, there are, there are certain, you know, uh, there's, I've been invited to do certain and workshops that I've regretted where it's the kind where the person after me is like today, you know, okay. It's, you know, it's the two weeks, the, you know, the hot belly two week thing. And if the second I finish, you run back there today, it's 50% off. And here are the things you'll get. And you'll get my personal. I've been to those workshops and I've regretted it because I always feel like I'm getting put in the same place as the charlatans. Mm. So that, that would be something I would have to, that would be, so generally I'm shark habit. However, it's a no. If you want my answer today, it's a no. Uh, there are some things I have to think about. So I didn't want to go, I shouldn't have gone into the weeds on that on your Perry, but you, you need to know. So there are times I will say, yes, uh, let me think about it. Hmm. And if, if there's any pushback, then it's no. Great. Yeah. And that's good to know because a lot of people have a hard time saying no in general and just be able to practice that for a little bit, right? Yeah, well, and you know, I mean, I, I was right, a hundred percent right about the not going to Moscow. I mean, they what they yeah. did. What I mean, and honestly, I'm, I'm with what happened to Brittany and what happened to some of the other people in there. You know, I, 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 yeah, I struggle. I mean, and of course, in the in their their attack on you, <laughs> their attack on Ukraine, uh, which is of course is going to go down in the history books as one of the uh, the. Uh, most interesting offenses of all time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> We're going to attack Iowa. And then you find yeah. out later, Iowa doesn't want to be. <laughs> so in wrapping up here, uh, Coach, my friend, um, you got any new projects, anything coming up? You're, uh, yeah, well, Easy Strength, Easy Strength Omni Book is, is finished. It's online at easystrengthomnibook.com. It's a PDF. I think it's very good. Uh, not selling well. And then I just finished its companion, Easy Strength for Fat Loss. But uh, that might not be going up for a, a little bit longer. You know, just, you know, just, you know, life gets in the way sometimes of uh, of things. Uh, yeah. What else do I got going on? In just a few weeks, I'll be heading out to St. Mary's and Twickenham, London and, uh, to teach again. I'm looking forward to that. I got Perform Betters this summer, only two. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to the place where I'm starting to, I'm, I, I, my goals have shifted. Um, you mentioned kindly about some of the personal issues I've faced, uh, in the past four years. Uh, and, uh, I'm starting to get that sense that, uh, uh I want to make sure, I want to make sure I spend time with my grandchildren, uh, my friends, uh, my daughters make sure things are you know uh, i want to make sure I, I leave a good legacy uh i'm doing speaking of legacy i'm working real hard on you know i'm a, I'm a big I, I try to donate to a lot of causes and i'm and i'm it's been kind of a fun couple of years because we're back to donors in my range are helpful again you know i i can't i can't write a check to put up a building at harvard but i can make a difference at a, at a smaller school or a program yeah I'm trying to do yeah well I love well you you make a difference in my life and uh, a lot of others so thank you very much for all that you do coach and you know for for being my friend as well and I'm Absolutely. grateful and honored for having you on the show and uh listen uh you're easy to work with as often as you like I can come in and 
and not stop talking for the whole time, Jen, it seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. It makes my job on this side way easier. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you. And uh, keep up the good work there, okay? You bet. <laughs> thank you, Coach. Have a great military press day. Uh, you bet. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye, Bye.